All right. Um, so thanks, thanks for coming. Um, also those attending online. So we're really happy to kick off this cycle of, of seminars with uh, John Banks, who's actually been here. Um, this, this is your third occasion here. I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's the director of the undergraduate research um, opportunity center at the California State University in Monterey. Um, he's a quantitative ecologist. He does a whole bunch of stuff, including <laughs> ecosystem services, food web ecology, ecotoxicology, conservation biology. Um, and he's here today to tell us a little bit about what he's been up to recently. Right on. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm happy to be the guinea pig for this hybrid uh, deal here. And I'll try not to speak too quickly uh, because um, I'd rather speak English slowly than sp my terrible Spanish. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today. Can you hear me okay but through the mask? It's also a challenge, obviously. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some stuff that I've been doing um, that's sort of a back to the roots for me, uh, where I started 20, 25 years ago in ecology. Um, so I'll start by showing you this picture. This is a picture that I took on my way to work in Monterey Bay, which is about maybe an hour and a half south of San Francisco on the California coast. And um, there is a, a major food production center in the Salinas Valley. And so a lot of the food that gets grown here gets exported uh, across the United States. Um, so they call it the salad bowl of the United States and all, all sorts of various titles that, to indicate how important it is. Um, and this is what a lot of people see as the face of agriculture. They drive by on the way to work. They think about it big big monoculture um, that's sitting out maybe in a patchwork of some different habitats. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about a project we've been doing to model agricultural dynamics. And the motivation, I don't think I need to really go over these numbers with most of you, you're probably aware, um, but, I, but I put these together anyway from, from some recent numbers that I was able to find. They get updated once in a while. Um, but about 40% of the of arable land is devoted to agriculture globally. Um, and a lot of the food production that we depend on would be destroyed by pests if we didn't do something about it. So, um, and estimates range from Pimentel, I think back 40, 30 years ago, estimated 30%. Now it's, you know, I've seen estimates as high as 45% um, would be destroyed, not just by insects, but also by um, pathogens and, and weeds and invasive species and so forth. Um, a lot of pesticides are applied to try to, to stave off these losses. Um, and I found some really neat uh, numbers in, in recent literature, 70,000 uh, different chemicals used in the United States alone um, applied to agriculture. And even in organic farms, there's a, there, are, there are sprays, there are chemicals that are, that are allowed, as you probably know, um, in organic uh, farming. But even there, people tend to spray um, a, a little bit more than they would have to in many, in many cases. And of course, um, the, uh, the, 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 the alternative to spraying pesticides are various types of cultural controls like intercropping and crop rotation and no-till agriculture and so forth that, um, that I'm going to talk a little bit about incorporating into some of the stuff that we're doing right now and explain what these things are as well. So with that, um, in real life, that monoculture isn't the whole picture. Here are some pictures that I've taken from various travels of different types of agriculture. Here you've got um, in Western Washington in the United States, you've got broccoli plants that are interspersed with weedy vegetation, mostly because it's expensive to get rid of these weeds or to use a chemical to get rid of them or to hand till. Um, this is a platano. A plantation in Costa Rica, and it's right next to a forest. So you have a very big difference in vegetation, but very close together. And so you can imagine there might be some interchange dynamics here. And this is an organic farm on the western side of Colorado in the United States, where they very deliberately are putting rows and rows of different crops. And one of these rows, you can't see it here, but it's bok choy, uh, which is very del delicious for flea beetles. And it's destroyed by flea beetles, but they aren't touching the cabbage that's next to it, right? So a trap crop that's pulling things away. So very deliberate um, ways of trying to, to control pests without pesticides. And there's a lot of both empirical and theoretical work that's been done for the last 40 years on 
um, the fact that if you put different types of plants together, it makes it difficult for herbivores to find them. Um, and that sort of falls under the resource concentration hypothesis. Um, and it also makes it more likely that you're gonna attract lots of different natural enemies. A lot of different pests uh, will, will have enemies that come there. And so if you have generalist predators, for instance, they can help uh, with some spillover, they can really contribute to biological control. And so this is stuff that I was really steeped in as a graduate student in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, because it, had, it was all sort of new in the seven, late 70s and 80s. Um, and um, in fact, I did spend some time early on in my career. Um, this is a project with Ricardo Bomarco up in Uppsala, where we looked at just a meta-analysis um, at the effects of adding increased plant diversity into a field. And it turns out, in fact, you can end up getting a lot, uh, a lot fewer pests overall. But that, that attenuates when you go from medium to large plot sizes. So there's a scale dependent effect here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that today in our modeling. Um, and just, just to hammer home that point, this is an air, you know, took this out of an airplane window, obviously. And if you look down, I like to, I like to look down at like landscape mosaics because they're really cool, right? Like what, how big are these chunks? But they're, this is no different than little, little plots that we do in a common garden experiment. They're just scaled up massively but that has consequences for the organisms that live in them. Um, and finally, by way of, inter by way of background, I, I did some work early on also, I got really interested in how uh, movement behavior of beetles in particular is affected by their landscape. So I did some cool stuff that um, basically drew on, uh, relied on theory that was developed by Akubo and Turchin and Kariva and, um, and others, Silovin looking at correlated random walks, like directed movement versus just random walks diffusion. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with these ideas, but, I, but we'll say a little bit more about them in a few minutes. Um, and found that by measuring how they turn and so forth, we got very different results for smaller plots versus larger plots. And just briefly, this is, the, this is a, a confidence envelope here, and they're exceeding what we would expect them, their, their displacement that we would expect if they were just randomly moving um, in, in the smaller plots, not in the larger plots. And so their, their, their directed movement is different depending on how large the landscape they're in. And so that has consequences too, as you might imagine, for biological control in different size field plots. So the work I'm gonna describe was done in conjunction with an applied mathematician, Dr. Amanda Laubmeyer, who is a professor now at Texas Tech University. Um, and my late father, H.T. Banks, helped start this project with us. Um, and Amanda and I have continued over the last couple of years to, to work on it. And really the, the inspiration for this is annual cropping systems. This is, this is me back in the day doing field work um, because annual cropping systems provide us, an, of a, they're important and they also provide a nice sort of discrete setting in which to explore some of these dynamics. And so as inspiration, as inspiration, we, we envisioned a tritrophic uh, a scenario. And again, this is a, a common, this is a common um, uh, scene in places where I trained and where I did a lot of my field work. We've got a plant, a crop plant. We've got aphids that are feeding on the crop plant. Um, and then we've got two different types of predators. So we've got carabid beetles, we've got ladybird beetles, and they're characterized by very different colonization behavior and also hunting behavior. And so we wanted to sort of contrast, we want to emphasize that contrast in the modeling, the modeling we've been doing. So for this model, we posit that there's a, there's a plant, first of all, that's growing. And I'll say more about that. I'll show you some equations in a minute, don't worry. But we're talking about a plant that's growing that gets colonized by a pest, the aphid, which grows logistically. It diffuses the pest Basically, um, occasionally, since we're modeling this on aphids, they start producing winged offspring. Those winged offspring then move around the field, right? And this is, again, this is based on um, this, this particular annual cropping system. And then we've got predation, they get eaten by a predator. The predators randomly walk around. So it looks like diffusion, if you look at the whole population. Um, they do have directed movement, however, towards prey. When there's a high concentration of prey, they start turning more frequently and honing in on the prey. 
And then um, we've got two different types of predators. As I said, the ladybird beetles fly in. We're positing, again, we're supposing they come in from the, the neighboring vegetation, hence the, the background about neighboring vegetation and those kinds of effects, or else they walk in, carabid beetles, right? And in the model, we've actually got some of both predators in the field early on, because if we're, if we're imagining no-till agriculture, carabid beetles are in the field already before the crops um, are placed in there, right? So we've got some, some nod towards that, that um, best practice. Here are the equations. Um, I can go through these real quick, but there, this A is the crop, which grows logistically and gets um, eaten by, by the aphids. Uh, this is the, the, these are the aphids, they grow exponentially and they move according to some diffusion rate dB and they also move faster if there's a predator around, right? Again, based on um, a lot of field work that, that has come out over the last decades, so they've got two, two reasons to move. One is they're just, they're just um, they're getting crowded and they start to make wing forms that, and they relocate, they redistribute within the field. And also um, they, they tend to drop and try to escape if they, if they see a predator nearby. Um, this is the predation term here. This is a diffusion rate. And there's also a directed, a directed prey taxis, we call it, a directed movement towards prey. Um, and this is the a velocity term that describes that. And there's some more mathematical fineries here that I won't get into very, mu very much here, but you'll see, um, you'll see these again. Um, this is a famous quote. You may have seen this before, the stat British statistician, George Box. Um, I always like to put this here. It's like a play, I just take a breath and write. All models are essentially wrong, but some are useful. We try to make them as useful as possible by parameterizing them with real numbers, right? And so um, where possible. And because I'm old and doing a lot of administrative duties, I don't get to go out in the field as often and collect data, unfortunately. Um, it happens to all of us. But we do have the literature to draw on. And um, it turns out that Amanda and I were involved with a group, um, ecosystem services group for several years up in Uppsala. And so a lot of the data, um, a lot of these, the, these parameters were from data from studies that were ongoing then. So we were able to draw lab and field studies, uh, draw on lab and field studies and in incorporate those in our parameterization um, for this model. So um, we really wanted to focus on, for this, the first iteration of this model, we wanted to focus on two things. We wanted to vary and, and fix everything else, right? Because otherwise there's way too many moving parts. So we're focusing really on the type of colonization. Are you a predator that flies in aerially into the field and looks for aphids. And if you ever watch um, um, uh, aphids, which I've done a lot, um, if, and, and they're predators, uh, things that, that fly in and colonize, like ladybird beetles are very, they're not great flyers, but they, they can move pretty far. And often they're coming in at a height that allows them to sort of identify their prey, or in some cases they're identifying an olfactory or a, a volatile signal or a chemical signal but they come in from the air and they can get right to the middle of the field and colonize. Whereas a crabbed beetle is just walking around on the ground, doesn't have that 30,000 foot view. And so we wanted, to, we wanted to contrast that. So we've got ladybirds coming in from the air column, crabbids coming in, walking across the field margin. Everything else we kept fixed. And we looked at this, at this for different fields, spatial sizes, and then also cranked up or down the rate of immigration for both these predators. And we did them one at a time. We looked at the crabid effects, uh, the crabids, and we looked at the ladybirds separately. So if you look at sort of the basic migration, we just fix the a low level of, of uh, immigration into the fields. If you look at the difference between how crabids behave as you scale from one hectare to 200 hectares, you see right away that over time, the one hectare, and by the way, on this axis here, this is aphid density, right? It's a log axis, but it's aphid, aphids, okay? So these are the pests. And they get out of control when you get up to 200 hectares. They're, they're better controlled when you're at, at one hectare. There's a spatial scale effect on how well the carabids suppress the pest. On the other hand, if you're a ladybird beetle, there's really, they're written variant across spatial scales. And this makes sense to us because the ladybird beetles are able to get all over the field the carabids have to come in. And I'll show you a spatial map in a few minutes that illustrates that, right? So there's already a spatial um, diff a difference in spa across spatial, uh, 
scale for the carabids that the ladybirds just don't see. And if you crank up the migration rates, so these are this these two panels here represent low migration rate, and this here we've cranked it up to high, you're really just exacerbating this effect. So you have the same differences between ladybird beetles and crabids, but but in this case, you've got um, you've got a lot more crabids coming in, but your differences here are are exas exacerbated a little bit. Also, if you look at field size, um, this is another nice way to look at this is the multiplicative effect uh, on, on aphid densities of just carabid predation. In this case, we just had carabids in the, in the simulation. And um, at 50, 50 hectares, um, you've got 35 times as many aphids as you do when you have a one hectare field. At 100 hectares, you've got around 43 times as many aphids as you do in a one hectare field. So there is a spatial scale, but it, but it attenuates, right? It sort of, it flattens out over time. And eventually it doesn't matter once you get to a certain field size. By the way, um, I neglected to mention this, but we modeled the field sizes in these simulations after the mean United States um, agricultural farm size, which is 180 hectares. So just, we, we tried to, again, scale that to something that was somewhat realistic. So if you look at a spatial map, um, this is um, this is that we generated these heat maps, and so the brighter colors here are higher densities of aphids, and the the the, the cooler colors, the blues, are lower densities. And it, uh, pay attention to the scale here because this will shift in a minute. So at one hectare, we've got four timestamps here, right? And what happens when the, you've got carabid beetles coming in from the from the field margins is you can see over time they corral all the aphids in the middle of the field because they basically have, they're surrounded, right? So they come in, the aphids on the other hand are able to reproduce like crazy. And so they can build up a population in the middle of the field. Um, and you can see already that has implications for pest control, right? So you've got a spatial element here that, um, that depends on the fact that the crabs are coming in from, from weedy, from field margins or forest or field in the sides of the, of the farm. Here's the, the same deal for ladybird beetles. These four panels from zero to 90 days show you that um, it's a little bit more mismatch, right? They're all over the place because the ladybird beetles come in from aerially. And so they're not just coming in from across the margins of the, of the plot. And again, this is at one hectare. So they're able to actually suppress them. If you remember that other, the scale over there, the, the last scale went to 1200, this is 300. So they're able to suppress them a lot more easily um, if you crank this up to 50 hectares, you see something similar, but the scale is different. So these are carabids. Again, they're corralling them. They're really concentrating them in, in little, little spots, but the, the population gets out of control because they're, they're the aphids are reproducing like crazy as those carabids corral them. And so they're actually able to escape a lot of the, the predation. Ladybird beetles, not so much. Um, they do, their populations go up a little bit more on a larger scale. We're talking going from one hectare to 50 hectares. They, um, they do uh, escape a little bit from the ladybird predation, but it's still much more effective. So um, here's some conclusions that we got from this first, um, this first effort. So colonization type, when you vary that um, and keep all the other factors the same, can really affect how um, you, you're able to suppress the pests in these different fields. Um, there's a nonlinear attenuation of the spatial scale effect, that graph that I showed you, the multiplicative graph. Um, and these are just some more numbers, but basically showing the same thing. That you go from 10 to 100 uh, hectares, you get only a 3.3 fold increase in the, in the aphid densities. Um, and aphid densities are higher, more concentrated, as you saw when it's carabids than they are with ladybird beetles based on the behavior of how those, those predators get to the field and, and attack prey. Um, the implications for IPM, trap crop, I talked to you about that before. So it could be that you've got ways of, um, you know, you've got something that's a trap crop, something that's sacrificial in the, in the middle of the field. If you've got, if you've got more carabid type predator, uh, predators at play, um, you could also do a, a targeted pesticide spray. Right, so you could realize that you're going to have a spatial pattern that requires some light spraying. And again, what I'm talking about here is integrated pest management. Right, it's it's a combination of sprays 
and using these biological controls. I did some other experiments back in the day looking at the effects of, I took, I took carabid beetles and put them in a, um, a cup and I sprayed them with pesticide. I had a light, I had, we had a license and all that stuff, it was cool. So we did that out in the field and then released them to see what would happen, right? So I really, and I'd love to do more work like this. And if anybody here is interested in doing more like this, we, this of this kind of stuff, we could collaborate because I, I think it's really, um, it's important to see how, how these sort of behavioral pieces add up. Um, so we did the same kind of study here, comparing uh, a random walk or just general diffusion with um, correlated random walk, very focused predatory behavior, and found um, that if, you, if beetles were sprayed with pesticide, we used imidacloprid back when it was still experimentally um, uh, released. It wasn't actually officially released yet. We had a, we had a sort of a preview of it. Um, I could say more about that, tell you more stories about, about that. Um, but we found that it actually, um, there, were, there were differences in their behavior between beetles that were sprayed with the pesticide and beetles that were sprayed with, with water. Although these differences are not as, as striking as, the, as they were with the different landscapes. But I can, I'll, I'll say more about that later. But in fact, this also made me think that it would be nice to look at uh, what would happen to beetles that are sprayed with pesticides um, in terms of their foraging ability in this model that we put together. So our, our latest efforts, right, which we're trying to write up right now, um, we added pesticide effects to the model. So what we did was we said there's gonna be a threshold spray trigger. So at a certain point, the aphids get to a, a you know, 250 or 500 or 750, um, the, the density that is. And then at that point, it triggers a pesticide spray. So you sort of imagine a farmer sort of monitoring the pest levels and then making a decision, a smart decision, a real-time decision about when to spray. Um, in our simulations, most of the pests die. So we're assuming an effective spray that, that they don't have a lot of resistance to. Again, there's, there's room to tweak that. Um, and also that predators experience a penalty when they get hit by the spray. So in, um, in our simulations, I'm gonna show you here, we, we assume a 90% reduction in their diffusion, not only their, their rate, but uh, of speed, how fast they move to the prey, but also how focused they are. They sort of lose focus, right? So they're not as, as directed. So we have a behavioral component now that we're putting into the model. The, the equations look the same, except we now have two populations of beetles that are in the field. Ones that don't, that are unsprayed, they're cool. They're just behaving like they always do. And once they get hit by a pesticide, they happen to be unlucky enough to be in the field when the aphids get to a certain level and they get hit by a spray. The ones that get hit by a, the spray are represented in this equation here. So this is the predator abundance and it's the same, the same uh, equation that I showed you earlier. But the ones that get hit by the spray now have a penalty and that's, that's designated by this one minus epsilon. They just go slower and they are not, here's another piece of that, they're, um, they're also not directed as much, right? So their speed is, is reduced and they're not, not as directed enough. That's all we're doing. So it's a sublethal effect, right? So this graph's a little bit complicated. I should never, you never say that, right? You should never say that. Like, oh, this is, you're not gonna understand this. This graph's a little complicated because we tried to split it up to show, to show something. Um, we could have just put it all in one graph. But what I, what I wanna show you here is, so this is the percent increase in average pest density, all right? So that's the increase there as you go up in um, speed, right? So faster and faster predators, right? Um, and this is a 90% penalty. So they're, they're basically being shut down. They, ca they can't move as fast, they can't move as directed. If you look at very small fields here, this first, this first line here is five hectares. Then, then we look at seven and then 10 and then 25 here. If you look at this, there really isn't much difference um, if, you're, if your predator diffusion is low or if it's high, um, they're, they're getting hit by this penalty, but it doesn't matter because it's a tiny field, right? It's five hectares. So they're able to like gobble up, imagine these carabid beetles running around, they're able to get all the aphids anyway because it's a small field and they were already um, controlling the aphids just fine. As you get higher and higher though, when you get up to about 25 hectares, there's a real difference. Um, there's, you know, the penalty for somebody who's, who's moving this fast makes a huge difference. The aphids get out of control. 
we took that line and put it over in this graph, which has all the big field sizes in it. And if you look here, this is a 200 hectares. Um, and, and, and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but the basic idea here is that once you get to a really big size, it, you know, having that 90% penalty doesn't matter because they already were unable to control the pests. So at 200 hectares, ah, who cares if you hit me with a pesticide? I wasn't doing a great job anyway, right? Basically, that's what we're seeing there. So that's why we split this thing apart. So you can see that for very large fields, the effect is really diminished, the effect of the penalty. Um, for small fields though, um, it also isn't, isn't a big deal. For intermediate fields, it is actually a critical thing. So it really does make a difference in the aphid populations. Um, a couple other preliminary results that we're, again, we're, we're still trying to wrap our heads around this. So I welcome input and questions and probing insights. Um, if you look at the, the migration rates of the predators, right? So you got only a few coming in from the, from the field margins or crank it up a little bit more or a very high migration rate. At the aphid density, that's these three bars up here. It really, um, it really stays low for a long time. You just have so many predators coming in. It's, they're, able to control, they're able to control the pest population. At low migration rates, these, these spikes, of course, are the triggered pesticide spray, right? So they, they build up and then bam, they get knocked down and they build up and they get knocked down. The beetle density you can see um, is, is in, the, in these bars here and the exposed beetle densities are here, right? And so these are beetles that don't get exposed because the spray hasn't hit and then the spray hits and you have, suddenly have a whole bunch of beetles that are exposed and they're not able to control as well, All right? So, um, so there's what we're looking at here is basically an interaction between biological control and pesticide sprays, which is really fun stuff to play with. Um, and then the last thing, um, we just sort of laid out different management strategies. So if you just have, if you're relying on biocontrol, right? That this is what it looks like. And you trigger all these pesticide sprays here. Again, you've got exposed beetles later on. Um, if we put some kind of beetle bank in the middle of the field. So we have a source of beetles in the field that is, um, are you familiar with beetle banks? So you put some vegetation, some, maybe some natural vegetation that harbors a population of predators inside your field. It's a trade-off, right? Because that's less yield, um, depending on what you're putting in that vegetation bank. But you can actually stock the field with predators. Um, it, it moves things over a little bit, but the dynamics behave fairly similarly. Um, another style of control is, could be what we call augmentative control, where you say, oh, I've got a problem in the field. I'm gonna take a bunch of beetles and release them. They're somewhere else, right? And um, I don't know about here, but in the US, you can go to a garden store and buy a bag of beetles. Is that true here? Yeah, yeah. So um, you can buy different, different natural enemies of crops and release them in your garden. It doesn't work too well because a lot of them are hardwired to, to go long distances when they're first released because they, they usually colonize from far away and so forth. But this augmentative control, um, you can see the beetle density here increases because there aren't any beetles and then you put them out, right? You, you, release, you open up the bag. Um, and you can see that actually we got pretty good control with that in this scenario. And this is just the, the control, not pest control, but the control, right? There's, no, there's no, um, no beetles at all. And it just triggers a bunch of pesticide sprays per the threshold um, in the model. So again, you can look at management strategies and, and the effect on how many times you have to spray, right? Which is one of the things that we wanna, wanna get at. So wrapping all this up, um, and then I'll take some questions. Um, so variation in colonization type and spatial scale, um, we established early on that was important for pest control. We were also able to look at an intermediate effect um, that at, at small fields, predators could control the, the pest. And so penalizing the, the predators with a movement penalty really didn't matter because they were so good at it that it didn't, it didn't really phase them. At large fields, in large fields, there wasn't much difference in biocontrol because it was so bad already, right? So that was that sort of intermediate pesticide effect. Um, and I just showed you sort of the interplay of mobility, immigration, and um, spatial scale. And what I'd like to do next is get, as I mentioned, get more detailed parameter estimates, right? So like, like do actual in situ experiments where we're looking at behavioral um, speed, um, turning angles, and things like that, which again, I find really fun. It's tedious, it's difficult to do, but it's fun. So. And that, 
is it, and I will take questions. Thank you very much, John. So we're gonna let's pass to the, the questions. So let's figure out if there's any more questions, no questions out of the chat. You good? You bet. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Very impressive amount of analysis and modeling. I was wondering for the um, I mean for the other part, do you have a corroboration of your models with field data? Not yet. No, that's exactly what I'd like to do next. That's one reason I'm here talking to you guys. So I'm hoping somebody's going to be doing field work that we could we could parameterize and 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 um, calibrate some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Not just got a question. If I can follow up on this, um, you mentioned better parametrization, yeah, uh, which is one one side of the story, and I completely agree it's important. But it is also suggesting like independent validation yeah. of the output, which yeah. is way more complex because, um, yeah, I guess I guess you need to think on what what do you want to measure on the field. So you can do both things, right? Or, or, or start yeah. well. The easier, yeah, thank you, Nacho. The easiest one, I think, would be to try to get um, uh, try to get some meta analyses that that look at. And I know there's there are um, there's literature available that we could probably cobble together. But that would be that would be easier because we don't have to set up a field system, right? So we don't have to do the the field work. But um, so that maybe that's so. So that was, I think, yeah. I understand now what that was what you were trying to get at. Um, so that would be the, that would be probably a good a good project to do next to try to to see if we could do a meta analysis to see if some of these things actually ring true um, from studies at different spatial scales. Right, the spatial scale is the biggest biggest problem. Right, I remember as a grad student, somebody writing an editor writing on one of my manuscripts at a journal saying you really should do. Um, 50 fields, uh, 150 hectares each replicates, right? I mean, they really thought that you should, it would, it would take like the size of Kansas, like a whole an entire state in the United States to, to actually get it, get it correct, right? So, um, but yeah, that would be, the spatial scale is the hard part. So, do these results mean that uh, biological control does not work very well in big fields. In use biological control in big fields because apparently in big fields the press does not have control. So I was wondering if you could use biological control but you as well in big fields. Yeah, thank you. So it, it it doesn't mean you can't use biological control in big fields. It just means that we need to pay attention to the details of the predators that are present, right? And and so, and one thing that um, that I should emphasize, and thank you for asking that question, is that we're looking at one predator at a time here, right? We don't have any predator-predator interactions, which could be synergistic, or it could be, right? It could be uh, subpar, um, or it could be additive, right? But we usually have a, a whole complex of predators at play. What we're trying to do is sort of identify the characteristics of these different predators that might make you think about supplementing or augmenting the control in a larger field. So it, yeah, so it does not mean you can't use biocontrol in those big fields. It just means you need to think about the spatial, the spatial interactions. Thank you very much. Uh, so this might not be completely relevant, but I mean, I, I always struggle with these, uh, I think what you just said makes perfect sense because we can hold in our specific things, but obviously there's a lot of layers. So one of the layers, I mean, especially nowadays, is is producing biocrops or, or something that doesn't have pesticides. So I don't know, is that another layer that, that you're looking into? Like spraying these things might reduce the value of the crop. And is that, you know, so is it is it better to use bio agents? You lose the crop or you Sell it for money or, or yeah we that's a great that's a great question Chris I think um, 
So you're talking about basically put it, layering in the economic. Exactly. Look, yeah. And so um, you would also have to think about the yield, right? I mean, obviously. So you can, uh, as I understand what you're saying is biocrop organic production, right? So you get a premium for that at the market, but you also have a hit in yield. And so you have a trade off there. And yeah. And that would, yeah, we'd like to do that, obviously. Um, and uh, that might be a collaboration with um, an ecological, uh, uh, an economic ecologist, or, or we could probably find some, some, again, some values in the literature. I, I agree, although there are some other issues with organic production and scale, right? So the scale at which it, it, it may not be, anyway, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you're right, there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of elements. I, I suppose that my, my main question was, so can, can that stuff be easily modeled or, or is that kind of then? Well, people, that people do, yeah, sure. Yeah, I think you could easily model it. I don't know that I'm going to model it, but I think yes, you could definitely put those factors in there. Yeah, and and there and you're right; they they should be in there, right? We often um, at our peril ignore that kind of stuff. We when we get into these sort of agroecological models. We don't think about the the um, even the pet the pesticide threshold. That was an element that often you wouldn't you wouldn't you wouldn't incorporate, right? You would just say they're spraying or they're not spraying. But actually, um, we try to try to think about. Um, farmers who are sensitive uh, to um, actually monitoring their fields, right? Which is increasingly the case. They're not just flying over in an airplane and saying every Thursday I spray, right? So we're trying to figure out, um, but but yeah, organic production is a is a tricky thing. Um, I've done work with farmer cooperatives and um, and in coffee, and so I can I can tell you that there there are a lot of complications when companies try to source organic production, but I, that's a whole different topic. So, but it is, it is does something to do with the scale and production levels, right? So the premium depends on a lot of things. It's not always the case that you can get more, yeah. basically. Looks very important that you have habitat for predators close to the crop all the time, as close as possible, right? Yes, and in the guess, yeah, that's one of our premises. Yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, the answer to the to my question is about <laughs> on the on the particular predator you're you're dealing with. But my question is, um, if you have like a big field plot, like say ten hectares. Like something like that, would you recommend um, having like a central patch of natural habitat in the middle of the plot? Would you recommend putting like um, lines of natural vegetation uh, intercrop with, with, with the crops? How in a, tech, in a 10 hectare plot, how much habitat? Would you need to keep for natural vegetation yeah. to, to allow biological control? That's a great question. And we don't have the answer in this model, right? So, but we could play around with that a little bit. We could start to think about, especially when we put the plants in, right? Then we can we can think about realistically calibrating the the habitat size to like like strips would support a certain number of predators and so forth. So we haven't done that yet, but that would be a nice, that'd be a nice way to to. And people do that, of course, with um, conservation biology, right? The single large or several small. I mean, we could just flip that um, and do that for this in this model. So maybe next time I'll report out on that. Thank you very much. Do we have more questions? Um, again, following on this, like getting more realism, um, that's something I, I, I'm asking. Like, your models are deterministic in terms that they produce a single. Now they are, yes, they're deterministic okay. still. Yeah. And what do you think, in a more philosophical question, on the importance of the stochastic uh, process? Let's say, um, immigration events or uh, so a lot of the process has a yeah. chance component yeah 
And my feeling, at least with pollinator, is that a lot of the discrepancies we see between models and observations mm -hmm. is that the variability yeah. is so high, and part of this variability is yeah. maybe unpredictable. And this is super philosophical. Do you think we can mm -hmm. mm, yeah. include these kind of things? Yeah, I, and you could easily make this stochastic, and we haven't done that yet, but that would be maybe the next, one of the next things. Um, and I, I agree, you have some, uh, you have some sort of uh, outlying events that can, that can completely disrupt the patterns that you see here. So I think, yeah, it would be very important, right? And so again, we're starting with the deterministic model because we wanna see some patterns, but we, need, we do need to add um, some realism. And, um, and of course, in biocontrol, there's all kinds of uh, stochastic disruptions that happen, right? So you have um, floods and you have, um, you have uh, just a good year or a bad year for aphids, right? So you have um, a lot of that variability that you could, um, you could do some, and you could do some sensitivity analyses that, that way as well, right? So, so you run it with stochasticity and then look at um, the parameters that are driving, even with, even with the variability, which parameters are most important. That would be the, that would be the way forward, I think. Yeah, I was by no means suggesting to model yeah. everything because I think that's <laughs> not useful. Yeah. But even within, yeah. Set of behaviors you are tracking. Yeah, we could we could make them all probability distributions and then pull from those. That that would be a perfect next step. In fact, I'll suggest that to Amanda because we're trying to create a whole series of sort of added realistic um, components in here. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Your studies and your opinion, what would be the best setup for applying this type of, of pest control? Like, when, when would be most, most, worth, most worth it to, to actually buy a, a, bag, a, bag, a bag of bugs? Yeah, that I have again, I have a problem with the bag of bugs because um, if you buy ladybird beetles, for instance, <laughs> um, it's not the same, right? Putting them in the field. Um, so, so that. That, that's my, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily go to buy a bag of bugs because ladybird beetles, at least at where I did, have done a lot of field work, they overwinter in the, the high altitudes in the glaciers. And so they, they're cold. And then when they come out of, when the spring comes, they fly hundreds of miles to crop fields, right? So they're up in the mountains, the volcanoes and at, at Mount Rainier and places like that. So when you freeze them at the, at the garden store and then you take them out of the freezer, they say, oh, we have to fly in many, many miles. And so they're, they, they don't stay in your garden, right? So um, there are other ways to do it, right? Augmented biocontrol. If you, if you don't use that example, um, I think, it, again, it's hard for me to say when. Uh, I don't know if you mean when, like what situation or the timing of that. Yeah. So if you have a small garden, it's worth it. Yeah. Or if you have a, a larger uh, plantation. Is it worth it? Yeah. I think with a larger plantation, what people are going to are these beetle banks, right? They, they actually build habitat, right? And again, you have to be careful not to, it takes away from the yield. So it's hard to convince some farmers to do that. But you have to build habitat because it's more sustainable than just releasing the, 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 bag, of, the bag of bucks. So um, as far as timing is concerned, you know, one of the things we're looking at here is by separating the two populations into sprayed and unsprayed, you have a whole population of unsprayed that are still operating normally. And so if you can time the release until after you, if you're going to spray until after you've sprayed, that will be helpful because then they aren't getting the contact from the pesticide. But beyond that, it's, it would be really hard to generalize. Yeah. All right. If this... There are not any more questions. We don't have any more in the chat. Thank okay. you very much, John. Yeah, thanks. Such an amazing talk.